If the win over Texas wasn't enough to tell you that the Oklahoma Sooners got the right man for the job, well, a little something happened on Saturday night that reinforced that. We'll talk about that on today's episode of Locked On Sooners. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Sooner Nation? Welcome to Locked On Sooners, and thank you for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase over at Game Time. My name is John Williams. You can follow me on Twitter at John Nine Williams. My buddy here is Josh Helmer. You can follow him on Twitter at Josh on Ref. You can also hear him Monday through Friday from nine to noon on the KRF Sports app. Josh, what a weekend it was! And the Oklahoma Sooners had a bye week, but still. Still came away with a bit of a win, um, at least from the PR standpoint of things. Uh, how was your weekend, first of all, before we dive into the college football weekend that was? Weekend was great. Uh, it was a little bit of a recharge, right? Less stress involved without uh, anything. Uh, well, no game from Oklahoma. So a pretty relaxing weekend. And obviously a result that uh, has Oklahoma fans and USC fans feeling some kind of way. Let's let's just dive right in. What do you make of what happened to USC versus Notre Dame? It it felt like that was coming. Whether it was going to be this week or next week against Utah or down the road against Washington, it felt like the the wheels were going to fall off because they'd been playing with fire for each of the previous two weeks and the you know, the 7 point win over Colorado, the 2 point win over Arizona now what looks like to be an improving Arizona team, maybe a much better Arizona team than what we thought at the beginning of the season. But it just seemed like that's the direction it was heading. And when your defense can't stop anybody like USC's defense can't, and your quarterback is having to do everything by himself, ultimately when you face a good defense or at least an opportunistic defense, things like this are going to happen. Caleb Williams, he's still a great player. But Lincoln Riley did not have his team prepared to go into South Bend and play that game Saturday night. And it looked a lot, and I've seen this comparison out there on on the social media, it looked a lot like the Baylor game from 2021 when, you know, everything is just kind of rolling and, you know, you you just – you kind of stumble out of the gate because you're up against a very, very physical opponent. Or you go to the second half of the Oklahoma State game in 2021 where – they just came out flat offensively. They had nothing in that game until the f- very final drive and still weren't able to get anything across into the end zone. So it just looked like a team that just wasn't ready for the environment that uh, was going to happen in Notre Dame stadium, the challenge that Notre Dame was going to give them and the physicality that, I mean, and that's kind of become the knock on a Lincoln Riley coach team, right? Is that they're just not up to the task. You look at the, final numbers it's not like sam hartman was just otherworldly in the game i mean he had a solid day 13 of 20 126 couple of touchdown passes but that doesn't scream 48 20 to you right notre dame as a team rushes for 125 yards that doesn't scream 48 20 to you so it's the other stuff right it's the the key moments that uh, you can't come away with stops and the you know the obvious which is the the three turnovers from Caleb Williams that uh, this team right now USC for them they're not built to overcome those types of mistakes not that anybody necessarily right I mean if you say your quarterback's going to turn the football over three times then probably uh, you know most everybody's not built to overcome that and yet that just sort of speaks to some of the problems that Oklahoma had with Lincoln Riley that obviously USC is having, which is they're not built to win a game ugly. And, you know, obviously you don't want to make a habit of that every single week. And again, I would come back to probably you're not winning a college football game. If you throw three interceptions, generally speaking, right. But USC is not really built to win a game. If they throw one interception or two interceptions because of what the, the defense is. I mean, it's, it's a team that's built around offense. 
It's uh, one side of the football. That was the cultural mess that Oklahoma had with Lincoln Riley here. It's where you had one phase of the football that you just couldn't depend upon at all. And when you get in those situations to where all of a sudden the offense isn't the offense and Caleb Williams isn't the quarterback that Caleb Williams is expected to be, guess what? You wind up with what happened in South Bend where it gets ugly in a hurry. And it's a stark contrast to what now we're seeing with the Oklahoma Sooners, a team that still isn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination on the defensive side of the ball, but they've got a defense that's capable of winning you a football game or at least making winning plays in a football game and an offense that's that's really good. It's a really, really good offense. And, you know, we're, we're not going to sit here and compare it to the, you know, the 2017 Baker Mayfield or 18 Murray or 19 Hertz, but it's really good. It's one of the best offenses in the country this season. And it's all coming together for Oklahoma right now that, you know, the win over Texas. I mean, that couldn't have been a, a better statement for Brent Venables to say, Hey, this is where we're headed. This is the direction that we're heading in as a program to reinforce just all the things he's trying to accomplish with this team, just kind of reinvent who Oklahoma football is and bring them back to what they were to you know, 1999 to 2011, 12, especially on the defensive side of the ball where it's intensity and physicality and aggression. You're starting to see the fingerprints on a Brent Venables team just as much as you are Lincoln Riley. And I mean, for as much gnashing of teeth as we had over the whole Lincoln Riley leaving at the time, I think even a lot of people felt like, okay, Lincoln Riley left, Brent Venables is here now. The future is in Brent Venables' hands, but now we're starting to see the future unveiled before us. Well, it was it was something you felt confident about. I felt confident about. Sooner fans felt confident about, which was maybe you had plateaued with Lincoln Riley and were actually headed the opposite direction. I mean, how many times have Oklahoma fans said that? And with reasonable evidence at the end of Lincoln Riley's tenure to suggest that just that was happening at yeah. Oklahoma where – you know, Bob Stoops in Oklahoma left you this situation and all of a sudden you lose those couple of quarterbacks and you don't improve defensively, you get worse defensively, and now all of a sudden you're not playing for or winning conference championships. So there was, again, tangible on-the-field evidence that things were not going the direction that Oklahoma fans would want them to go with Lincoln Riley. So the hope with Bernard Venables, of course, was, okay, here's somebody that – first of all, in his first stint with Oklahoma, all the different things that he and OU accomplished. That's not to mask or sugarcoat or act like the end of it was everything perfect. Obviously, it wasn't for Brent Venables. But then guess what? He goes and resurrects his career. And if anything, sort of is stamped and defined by a lot of the success in his career that he had at Clemson where he turns into the the top defensive coordinator and they win multiple national championships and Clemson becomes you know a program that frankly Clemson had never been before right i think they had what the other national championship uh, way way back when but it's you know correct me if i'm wrong here i don't know that Clemson was ever regarded as a blue blood in college football and yet Brent Venables alongside Dabo Sweeney was a big part of being the architect of turning Clemson into that. So right there was hope that Brent Vittable's return, he could recreate that, reestablish that physicality, primarily on the defensive side of the football, but just because he'd been a part of winning national championships. And, okay, the work's not done, and there's only so much pointing and laughing you can do at USC, right? Ultimately, you want Oklahoma to be successful. And at some point in time, right, we all cross the bridge to – okay, enough with USC. It is it is a little bit of point and laugh, and it makes you feel good because you don't have those problems, right? You're not connected to that anymore. But at the end of the day, it's about what can Brent Venables do at Oklahoma? And it was going to come down to, is he going to deliver that at Oklahoma? And now the proof is starting to be in the pudding. And I'll, I'll give Oklahoma fans this for the right here and right now, right? To where the, the wound, I don't know that it's even still necessarily fresh, in a sense, John, but this is sort of the final moving on phase, if you will, for Oklahoma to where it's Oklahoma's back to playing championship football. And guess what? The signs are that USC is not going to be doing that. And that's the key right there is it took a year and a half for the Brent Venables hire and the Lincoln Riley to departure for Oklahoma fans to feel like, yeah, we got we've got the better end of the stick. And the evidence is on the field because we have a defense that doesn't require superhuman quarterback play in order to win. 
That's complimentary football, and that's what's at Oklahoma. We're going to talk about Oklahoma in the now and what we're looking at over the second half of the season. Six more games to go to set the stage for Big 12 title aspirations, college football playoff aspirations. We'll talk about that here after the break. Hey, you're looking for the UCF tickets. There's no better place to go right now than the Game Time app available in whatever app store you get your apps. Go download it. Best last minute ticket deals available for you for football, basketball, baseball, a ALCS. If you're looking for ALCS, NLCS tickets, you might need to go check out Game Time because they're going to have last minute deals, not just before the game, but even an hour after the game starts. You might be able to find some tickets. Thunder about to get going. You know, we got college football hot and heavy right now. The NHL season is kicking off as well. Again, go to game time. My favorite part of this app is that not only do they show you the best deals at the last minute, it's also they show you where you're going to sit and what you're going to be looking at when you're sitting there. Sometimes you don't know what you're getting into when you buy a ticket and what you're going to be looking at, but game time shows you your perspective from the app. So go download it wherever you get your apps. Use our promo code locked on college for $20 off your first purchase in the game time app today. Again, go to game time, download the app and use our promo code locked on college terms and conditions apply. But download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Prize picks is really simple to play, ladies and gentlemen. You can make your picks, submit an entry in less than 60 seconds. And if you're like me, yes, you want to test your skills with prize picks this football season. It's an exciting way to play, it's the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps, but you don't have to take up much of your time again in order to do that because it's so simple and easy to play, and you can submit that entry again in less than 60 seconds. So go to prizepicks.com backslash locked on college. Use our code locked on college for a first deposit match up to $100. Go to prizepicks.com backslash locked on college. Use our code locked on college for that first deposit match up to $100. And thank you for making locked on soon as your first listen every single day. Also go check out some of our other great podcasts. Again, Locked on stars for NHL locked on thunder for the NBA. There's a lot of great shows across the locked on network that has your team covered every single day. But Josh, we got six games left in the regular season for the Oklahoma Sooners. And we did this exercise a little bit uh, a few weeks ago. And is there a game on this schedule that you're feeling a little bit worse about after week seven than maybe you were feeling prior to, to the weekend? Yeah, it's Oklahoma state. Yeah. After the last two weeks, uh, how, how could it not be? Ollie Jordan, stand up. <laughs> that's that's an Oklahoma State team that uh, all of a sudden is playing really good football. Meanwhile, on the, the other end of that equation, don't you feel good that the Iowa State game was in Norman and you got that one out of the way and all of a sudden that looks like, you know, this side of Texas, that's Oklahoma's best win is uh, the win over Iowa State, which is sort of crazy to say a couple of weeks down the road. I don't know that I definitely didn't feel that way going in. I mean, I'm, I'm the first one to raise my hand when I get it right, and I'm the first one to raise the hand when I get it wrong. And I was sitting here telling you all these problems that Iowa State had. Same thing about Oklahoma State, so kind of different ends of the spectrum in the sense that you already played Iowa State and you played great there. Oklahoma State, it looked like, you know, as much of a – as a Bedlam game can be that. And yes, insert your rivalry jokes about Bedlam right here. But as much as a Bedlam game can be a walk in the park, kind of felt like this thing was trending in that direction for a Bedlam game. And now obviously uh, feel a little bit differently. So uh, each of those two with what Iowa State and Oklahoma State are doing, that's been uh, pretty impressive. The other side of that would be UCF. Probably feel better, right, about that game. Uh, Kansas, maybe I'm – even there, you know, I, you know, it's probably Jalen Daniels play. That's the big question mark, right? Sure. On everybody's mind. Well, what, what about you? Where do you stand with what the schedule looks like now for OU? Yeah, I think, I think you hit it with Oklahoma state, but TCU all of a sudden showed a little life uh, this past weekend. They had a quarterback throw for 400 yards and four touchdowns. Uh, so maybe they're figuring some things out offensively. 
I I just don't know really what to make of the Big 12. You know, is Oklahoma State as good as they were this past Saturday? Uh, you know, is you know, is TCU gonna be better? BYU just got boat race. I mean, that was the game that I think a lot of people were concerned about being up in Provo, mm -hmm. being at the end of November. I mean, after what TCU did, you got to feel better about that game. And really, with the way the new Big 12 squads have looked in their first season in the conference. I don't know how you can't feel great about going into Provo against whatever BYU team. Now it's going to be a tough game. It's going to be a tough environment. Yada, yada, yada. I totally get that. I don't want to undersell that, but yeah, I, I'm feeling better about UCF. I just don't think they're going to be able to stop Oklahoma's offense at all. You know, Kansas ran for 400 yards of <laughs> ran for 400 yards um, in the Jayhawks win just a few weeks ago. Jason Bean only threw the ball 12 times in that game and they were able to just, absolutely crushed the Knights. Now, Oklahoma struggled in the run game, so can they get some things going this weekend? It would be a perfect time to get the ball rolling on with the ground attack. Uh what about you all in the comments? You know, drop a comment over on the YouTube section if there's a game that you're feeling better about, worse about, uh but I mean, you look at the last six games of the schedule, you got UCF coming to Norman, you go to Lawrence to face Kansas, you go to Stillwater to face Oklahoma State, you get West Virginia go to BYU, and then you get TCU at home. Uh, I mean, it's still very much a, a lot of unknowns. I think you know West Virginia looked pretty good in their wins over Texas Tech and TCU and then went and gave up you know 41 points to Houston, albeit one of, one of those was on a last-minute you know Hail Mary uh, that won the game. But, I mean, if you're a defense that's serious or you're probably not giving up 40 something points to Houston, although that's an improving offense. So, I mean, I just, I really don't have a great read on a lot of the teams on the rest of Oklahoma schedule. So Brent Venables the other day, I can't remember if it was immediately after the win over Texas. I think it was beginning of last week when he was talking with the media after a practice said that the final six games, much more difficult than the front six games, which makes sense when you consider, hey, you played Arkansas State, Tulsa, okay, looks like they're improving uh, as the season goes along, but hey, it's Arkansas State and Tulsa, right? SMU, there's only so much that SMU, there's only so much you're going to say about SMU as a top 25 type team. They're not that team, right? So with those, the non-conference portion kind of being what the non-conference portion was, I can understand where Brent is saying, okay, the final six, it's going to be more challenging than the front six. But what about this, okay? Did Oklahoma just come out of its most difficult three-game stretch of the season, or are they about to embark upon that with UCF at KU at Oklahoma State? I don't think that final three-game stretch, West Virginia at BYU TCU, is the most difficult, and Texas probably on its own merit right now, right, holds a lot of weight in this discussion. But where, where do you stand on that? the difficulty of this next three as compared to maybe the last three. I would say I'd still put the, the previous three ahead of the next three, because I do think Cincinnati's defense is good. You know, even if their offense isn't very good. And even though Cincinnati can be thrown on a little bit, that defensive front is still really, really good. You know, the Texas game. I mean, obviously, Texas is a really good football team. They're going to be in contention for that second spot in the Big 12 title game. And then Iowa State, they're showing that they're better than what everybody thought they'd be. Now, West Virginia is also showing the same thing. Uh, so I don't necessarily want to discount that at all. But with with Kansas, I mean, it's so up and down, like they could look great for a half. And then, you know, Jason Bean throws two interceptions in the second half and kind of gives that one, you know, to Oklahoma State. Uh, going to Stillwater, I mean, that's going to be an electric atmosphere, especially if Oklahoma State's able to hold serve over the next you know few weeks. Uh, and then, you know, uh, UCF, again, I don't really trust their defense to be very good, but their offense is capable of putting up some points if you're not careful. So I think that could be a tough game. I think if you had me rank the three sets in Big 12 play, I'd probably put the previous three, the next three, and then the final three is how I would rank them. But uh, I, I do think that, you know, you have potential challenges with Oklahoma State and, and with Kansas. Uh, I think they win going away this this weekend against UCF. But um, but yeah, I think this next six games depth wise versus the first six, first six. I totally see what Brent Venables, where Brent Venables is coming from. Um, you take maybe the 
you know, the Texas game out of the equation. And definitely that next six is going to be a little bit more challenging for the, for the Sooners. Well, and I'll echo what I think I said here last week, which is these next six are going to show me, okay, how well can this team handle something great happening to it that, that they created, by the way. So I'm not just saying this was gift wrapped to them. They, they went and earned it versus Texas, but I think that it's an Oklahoma program that will handle prosperity well because historically they've done that. And I think that they're all business, but these next six games are going to show me how all business Oklahoma is. And the other Mm -hmm. thing I would say about the, the remainder of this schedule, John, is this, even though Kansas is honestly probably a little bit better than I thought minus Daniels at the beginning of the season going in. I mean, the way that that offense is able to score points, even minus its star starting quarterback is is pretty impressive. And even though Oklahoma State, uh, as compared to where we were at three weeks ago, clearly has shown signs of life and they're better, there's nobody in this final six for me that is good enough to where I look at it and say, yeah, I expect Oklahoma to really, really struggle in this game or they're going to get beat. I mean, I expect Oklahoma to go win all of these games by a couple of scores because I think Oklahoma's more complete top to bottom than every single team on this schedule remaining. So that's my expectation for Oklahoma. I want to see Oklahoma live up to that business-like expectation. Again, not living under the unrealistic standard that at some point in the second half somewhere of Kansas, Oklahoma State, and BYU, or TCU right at home or whatever, that you couldn't get challenged a little bit. But honestly, I'm also not living away from the reality that Oklahoma couldn't win convincingly in all six of these games, John. I think Oklahoma's that good in the schedule is, you know, not taxing in a way that that's possible for Oklahoma. Yeah, everything is possible right now for the Oklahoma Sooners over the final six games of this season. And I think you're right that really making statements in each of these games is very much on the table because this team seems locked in and focused on the business the business that they have at hand. One guy that seems to be pretty well locked in on the business that he has, that's uh, one Bill Beatonbow who seems to be trending in the right direction for one highly coveted prospect in the 2024 recruiting cycle. We'll talk about that next. Athletic Brewing Company has completely changed the non-alcoholic beer game because guess what? They make non-alcoholic beers that wait for it actually taste good full flavor they're well crafted just like a full strength beer which is important right if you you want to be a part of the party but you want to be the life of the party but also you don't want to be the life of the party and oh by the way no hangovers ever right that's what you want that's the the big thing i'm always selling is there's nothing wrong with uh, waking up with no hangovers ever. And you can get that from Athletic Brewing Company where you can fit in. You won't miss out. And, oh, by the way, they've got all different styles of non-alcoholic brews. They've got 50 different styles, IPAs, Goldens, Sours. So whatever your flavor may be, Athletic Brewing Company, they've got it for you. You can find Athletic in-store, online, and at bars around the country. They are the fastest-growing non-alcoholic brewery in the U.S. So get on board. And why should you get on board? Because, again, they make stuff that actually tastes good. First-time customers, use our code LOCKEDON to get 15% off your first online order. That's code LOCKEDON, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, at checkout for 15% off at athleticbrewing.com. Near beer, exclusions and conditions apply. Athletic Brewing Company, fit for all times. So not only did the Oklahoma Sooners get a bit of a win during their bye week with the loss to US or the USC loss to Notre Dame, the Oklahoma Sooners got some positive momentum brewing with Grant Bricks, the four-star offensive lineman out of Iowa Uh, three predictions came through favoring the Oklahoma Sooners. First, it was Brandon Drum of OU Insider at Rivals. Then Josh McQuistion jumped on board as well. Josh McQuistion of Sooner Scoop and on three. And then that was followed by a future cast from Greg Smith, a Nebraska Insider from Rivals as well. So things are trending very, very positively for the Oklahoma Sooners with Grant Bricks, who is one of the best offensive linemen in the 2023 or sorry, 2024 recruiting class. He is a 
uh, the number 90 prospect in the on three industry composite ranking. Uh, he is a number 56 in their, their on three rankings, number 87 by ESPN, 99 by rivals. This dude is a really good prospect for the Oklahoma Sooners and someone they've been really going after for some time combating with Kansas state and Nebraska and on, and a little bit of Alabama as well to contend with. Well, as we always say in these hashtag Cruton wars, it's a good sign when somebody that's not on the Oklahoma beat is submitting uh, 24 seven sports, crystal balls or rivals, future gas or an on three prediction, whichever uh, direction we're going here. Right. And whatever ESPN I'm sure is soon to uh, unveil, right. Which whatever their prediction looks like in the future, but it, it sounds like, looks like smells like things are going well for Oklahoma in this grant bricks uh, recruitment, which you start thinking about this and Eddie Pierre Louise. I mean, we still feel like there's a chance there for Oklahoma. Obviously you just got another big time commitment in Daniel Akin Kunmi. So this, this recruiting class for Oklahoma along the offensive line that at one stage, I don't know, take me back three, four months ago, back to the, the summer, John, people were concerned. They, they were worried that this was not going to be a very good offensive line class. And lo and behold, give Coach Biedenboe, assuming that this does come into place, which it feels like it's trending that way with Grant Briggs, this is the this is the piece to close here that can really, really get folks excited. And that's not to take anything away from what already is in this offensive line class for Oklahoma. It's just the blue chip equation piece to it, right? To where all of a sudden everybody looks up and says, you know what? This is a really fine close from Bill Biedenboe and from Oklahoma in, in terms of this offensive line class and to where all of a sudden collectively you look at the names that are on the board for OU and it winds up even if you don't add that other name to it it winds up being a really really good offensive line class to Oklahoma and the other thing I would say in closing on it John is this is what we sold right that Oklahoma is good at closing in terms of a, a recruiting class but number two if you won it was going to really, really help you. Uh, duh, no brainer, right? But Oklahoma's six and zero start and beating Texas. I mean, yes, to some degree. I mean, come on, that had to have helped here. Yeah, there might have been some wait and see for several prospects along the way, just because of the six and seven season. You you can't help but have a little bit of a doubt about a program in a first year head coach's first season when they go six and seven. It's understandable, but. They're turning things around six and zero start. You beat a top five Texas team in the cotton bowl on national television with ESPN college game day. Dylan Gabriel has a Heisman moment in the game and that everybody's still talking about a week later. Kirk Herb street is talking about there's one player that's had a Heisman moment. And that's Dylan Gabriel, man. Everything is, everything is coming up roses right now for Oklahoma, whether it's on the national landscape during the college football season or on the recruiting trail. Now it's just a matter of finishing. We're, a little less than two months away from the early signing period, uh, four months from the national signing day. And now's the time for Brent Venables and his staff to really hammer down and, and close on some of these prospects. But everything seems to be looking like it's going in a great direction for the Oklahoma Sooners. And that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Sooners. Thanks so much for tuning in and being a part of the show. Make sure you're here Monday night, 9 p.m. Central Time for our weekly live show where we'll get into whatever comes down the pipeline on Monday, as well as your thoughts, your comments, your questions about Oklahoma and the rest of the schedule, where we're headed. I'm sure there'll be some, uh, some uh, enjoyment of the USC loss as well in the YouTube chat. So again, subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. But again, be here Monday night, 9 p.m. Central Time. Follow Josh on Twitter, at Josh on Ref, myself at John 9 Williams. The show is at Locked On Sooners and on Facebook, Locked On Sooners Podcast. But until next time, he's Josh Helmer. I'm John Williams, Boomer Sooner.